constituent assembly uh, of India, and we had only one constituent assembly, um, and the court, the Supreme Court today. And um, as I see it, um, the decline of citizenship in the understanding of the Supreme Court. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. I'll connect it to contemporary cases, um, but I'd like to start uh, with the periods of certainly this continent's history that I find most fascinating because it is in the history of the 90s, 1930s and the 1940s um, that has envisaged your citizenship and my citizenship. And it is in those methods that envisaged the social fabric that defines this country. So with that, let's now be deflected to a PowerPoint. Um, so very simply put, three parts to this talk, conversation, and it's a conversation. If something just immediately doesn't make sense, please feel free to jump in and raise your hand. I want to talk about the context of creation of India and Pakistan's constitutions. Two, I want to talk about contemporary India and the contemporary court, my constitution's country, rights to life, liberty, equality, and dignity, of course, through some of my own cases, because I just happen to know, know those best. Um, and then the Supreme Court and the decline of citizenship, right? The failure to recognize individual autonomy and the autonomy of individual citizens as opposed to larger socioeconomic rights, which tend to be more group-based um, rights. So, the context. So, Act 1, I like to think of constitutional law as being acts in a play. So, Act 1, the context of creation of India and Pakistan, because it sets the context for imagining our present day constitutional fabric as well, right? So um, the book that I'm just finishing really thinks about, and you have a constitutional professor sitting here, so really thinks about constitutionalism from the perspective of institutions, constituent assemblies, parliaments, judiciaries, militaries, and you use the development of those institutions to assess anything. For instance, minority rights, for instance, constitutionalism, for instance, democracies. And, and so this is what I think about when I think about constitutionalism. I don't think about it as Article 1 says this and Article 10 says that. It is more about how do these institutions, how have they navigated the past, how have they navigated the present, and how will they hold up in the future? This is the context of constitution making uh, by the first constituent assembly. So even though Indian constitutionalism would have started, as Rohit Day reminds us, as Dieter Rotman reminds us, um, in, in the mid-1800s, the context of this constituent assembly's working is, in fact, partition. And this is a, a train full of uh, you know, refugees, displaced people, whichever way you want to think about it, going from either newly demarcated Pakistan or uh, now divided India. Now, how do you think about constitutions, right? What is this legal instrument that is a constitution? Um, and I'd like to think about constitutions as unusually significant legal instruments with just grave consequences for present and future generations. Why is constitution making so perilous? It's perilous because drafters in constituent assemblies must envisage a legal instrument that at once creates new identities, interprets old ones, imagines values that both suit the identities of the past and the present, while speaking to the values of the revolutions that preceded the constitution-making project. In post-revolution societies, constitution-making is an exercise in risk management, for a new revolution must not break out while also prescribing values for future generations who are often unknown to the drafters. Constitution makers must importantly, in the words of John Elster, enable reason to triumph over passions of majorities and minorities within a population. Which kind of takes us to the present context where the passions of majorities are often uh, prioritized over a constitutional fabric um, that expects reason to sort of be the predominant value. So this is sort of the context of constitution making. This is um, a very sort of morose looking Nehru and an equally relatively sort of 
unhappy looking Jinnah, and that's Lord Mountbatten. The only gentleman who looks quite untouched and sort of bemused is the gentleman behind Mountbatten, because presumably he doesn't really have to think about uh, envisaging or governing a nation. Uh, this is the birth of India's freedom. You'll see that two countries are being crafted at the same time. It is India's freedom as well as Pakistan's independence. Pakistan formally gets independence a day before, but both countries are created under the Indian Independence Act of 1947, right? What did partition mean during partition, 1946 onwards? 4.7 million of Pakistani Hindus and Sikhs migrated to India, while 6.5 million Muslims migrated from India to Pakistan. The 1998 census of Pakistan recorded less than two and a half million Hindus. By 2050, India will have the world's largest population of Muslims, 310 million Muslims and 1.3 billion Hindus. Numbers are important, not because you know, they're, they're critical to imagining and envisaging minorities and majorities, but numbers are important because it tells you the burdens of constitutionalism and the burdens of a constitutional fabric and the burdens of ignoring constitutional values, right? This is sort of partition era refugees coming into um, uh, an old fort in Delhi. I, I drive past this fort when I go to work every day at the Supreme Court. Of course, now it's sort of sanitized of human beings uh, and it's now sort of administered in a way to keep human beings out. But 10 minutes from today's Supreme Court, then Parliament, then Constituent Assembly, Delhi was flooded with refugees. This was the context of partition and constitution making. Those are partition era violence. These are could well be Indian citizens, could well be Pakistani citizens, it doesn't really matter. This is the kind of devastation that preceded the adoption of India's constitution and the eventual adoption of Pakistan's constitution. And this is Nehru addressing um, the Constituent Assembly at that time. And this is the chairman of the drafting committee. And I'm going to play for you, hopefully it will play, a clip from what he says in the Constituent Assembly. And it's a really important clip because he talks about the prejudices um, and the lack thereof of majorities uh, and minorities. And I'll tell you why it's such an important clip. context to this clip, and it's wonderful to hear Ambedkar's voice, the context to this clip is that partition has been announced, the assembly has sat for four or five hearings, the Muslim League decides to boycott um, the assembly proceedings, and this is Ambedkar speaking. And if I, therefore, 
from this place, support Dr. Jaikar's amendment. It is because I want all of us to realize that whether we are right or wrong, whether the position that we take is consonance with our legal rights, whether that accords with the statement of May 16th or December 16th. Leave all that aside. This is too big a question to be reduced to the position of mere legality. So here is Ambedkar saying a couple of things that has contemporary resonance. And one of the fascinating things about the chairman of the drafting committee, Dr. Ambedkar, is that his conception of constitutions and his, his conversations within the assembly are timeless, right? They're not simply timeless because of the icon that he has become in contemporary India. They are timeless because of the technical finesse of the submissions he makes. There is not a case that I have litigated in the Supreme Court where I have not looked to or quoted Ambedkar. And those cases are across the board. Extrajudicial killings, allegedly by the military in India, Nas Foundation, challenge to sodomy law, um, right to education, and so on and so forth. And this is a more general sort of submission that he's making. But let's look at this general submission. He's saying, let us not cater to fears. Let us not stoke those fears. Constitutions are not just issues of legality. They are questions of legitimacy. Let us cater, if need be, to the prejudices of our opponents to, in fact, seek to bring them in, right? And these are all important, and these are all strategically valuable ways of understanding not just the politics of then, but the politics of now. What, the, what are the demands, therefore, of constitutionalism? Are the demands of constitutionalism simply democracy and electoral exercise, franchise? Or are the demands of India's constitutionalism something more? Are these the demands of India's constitutionalism, not stoking fear, not walking away from opponents? So in contemporary India, before I go back to constitution making, in contemporary India today, amid extraordinary violence, I mean, extraordinary stoking of fears by those who should not be doing so, by governments in place. I think at, at, at moments such as this, whether it's caste violence, whether it's violence against religious minorities, whether, the, whether it is the lynching of Muslims or the lynching of Dalits, it is at moments such as this that it is important for all of us here to remember that there were moments such as this before when this constitution was being made. And at those moments, these were the responses of the drafters, the crafters, and the leaders of the time. So if your leaders, your crafters do not respond similarly, what is clear is that what is at stake is not electoral victories. What is at stake is the constitutional fabric of this country, right? Okay, so moving along then. Post these, these kind of these conversations in the Constituent Assembly, uh, and, and with the Indian Constituent Assembly adopting a technique, and I'm only going to talk about two techniques, one adopted in India, and by contrast, one adopted in the Pakistan Constituent Assembly to make a simple point, which I'll come to. But in India, Hannah Lerner says that the drafters of that Constituent Assembly adopted a strategy of constitutional incrementalism rather than revolution. And what is this? By just choosing to, choosing to differ controversial choices to the future. What are these controversial choices? The adoption of a uniform civil code, the adoption of a national language, if at all. So within the assembly, Hindi was made the official language of the union, while English was retained to be used for all official purposes. So in today's context, where in contemporary Indian, mainstream contemporary Indian politics, where the question is then um, brought up of whether Hindi should be the national language or that simply Hindi is the national language, that is just constitutionally inaccurate, 
right? And these questions came up in the 40s as well. And your drafters adopted a very clear strategy of not opting for that solution. These identity-based strategies were adopted in the words of Rajendra Prasad, the president of the Constituent Assembly, who said that the choice of national language would have to be carried out by the whole country, and that even if a majority of the Assembly made a choice which was not approved by a section of people, then implementation of the Constitution would be rendered perilous. So, the point I'm making is simply this, that it is not for the first time that these questions of interracial violence, interreligious violence, caste violence, language questions have come up. We have lived those cycles of violence and genocide before. But the only way you stem and stop those, those cycles of violence and genocide is you opt not to stoke, quote, in the words of the chairman, those fears, right? You opt to make strategic choices. You understand that your constitution is an instrument of risk management. You don't expand the risk. Good governance means you contract the constitutional risk, right? So, by contrast, what is a different strategy that could have been adopted? And it is Pakistan's Constituent Assembly that gives you a very different strategy that could have been adopted. And in Pakistan, a key question that comes up in the Constituent Assembly is whether you can use Bengali within the Assembly, because at that point, remember, it was undivided Pakistan. There was Pakistan that included East Bengal and West Bengal. So it didn't, it was, it was on two flanks, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, right? Um, and what would eventually become Bangladesh. And a critical reason for this second partition was in fact language, right? What would be the official language, a question that arises in India today. And here's a very brief clip from, from the Pakistan Constituent Assembly. I'll read that out to you because I'm a little short on time. So within the Constituent Assembly, this is in 1948, um, Constituent Assembly of Pakistan, vo Volume 1. It's a great read. If you've not read the Constituent Assemblies of Pakistan, then you should because comparative interest and also it will teach you to value your own constitution in a, you know, in a more intimate way. Um, so within the Constituent Assembly, some members are asking that Bengali be used within the Assembly, in addition to English and Urdu. This is what Dhirendranath Datta from East Bengal says, quote, Bengali is the language of the majority of the people of the state. He adds that out of 6 crores 90 lakh people inhabiting the state, 4 crores and 40 lakh speak the Bengali language. Hence, he felt it should be the state language since a majority of people speak it. Liaquat Ali Khan, the Prime Minister and Defence Minister of Pakistan, responds to this by saying rather categorically, Pakistan is a Muslim state, Urdu is the language of Muslims, unquote. There are two ways to resolving identity-related issues or language-related issues in this case. One way is to pummel one's ways through and pick a national language while marginalizing those who identify as speaking something else. The second way is to arrive at strategic compromises by allowing use of both or arriving at techniques that will embrace um, a, a variety, a diversity of identity-based choices. India's Constituent Assembly makes clear that a successful constitution-making project in a diverse post-conflict society that India was at that time necessitates a more consensual approach. So when we envisage now the laboratory for Indian constitutionalism, this is the contemporary laboratory of Indian constitutionalism. You had partition then, you have our country today, right? And this is the census figures of 2001. Um, at that time, 1.2 billion people, 800 uh, million Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, others and a religion not stated. So a really, not just a large, but a multi-ethnic, multi, -ethnic, multi 
um, religious, diverse society. So this is the stake, this is the context. Um, and there are many ways of envisaging the context in which a Supreme Court functions, but this is one context to envisaging how a Supreme Court will function. This is the laboratory in which the Supreme Court functions, right? This is the demographic um, reality of India. This is, of course, um, the apex court uh, of the country on a day that clearly looks like pollution levels are low um, because you can actually see the sky. Um, and so then I want to talk about, um, now in, in the second part of the lecture, I want to talk about how the Supreme Court has responded, right? How this, quote unquote, the world's most powerful apex court has responded to questions of individual autonomy, right? Because the Supreme Court has had a kind of inconsistent jurisprudential position, right? The same Supreme Court that has been quite glorious when it comes to issues of governance, uh, sometimes socioeconomic rights, that is, has a kind of uber-muscular uh, sense of self and a jurisprudential role that, will, that it will adopt, arguably even a governance role that it will adopt in this country, turns to be a rather a different role uh, when it comes to individual autonomy. And in cases after case, the Supreme Court of India adopts a role that most judges in other parts of the world are frankly unused to. This is a court, much like Pakistan, much like Nepal, that does pretty much everything. Issues of governance, this is my client, TSR Subramaniam, this is a case on governance reform that we'd filed before the Supreme Court asking that every bureaucrat in the country, so IAS officers, predominantly in state and federal cadres, will actually have fixed terms, fixed tenures of three years, uh, because otherwise you have political, uh, the political class doing rapid transfers. So I don't know if many of you followed the newspapers in Hyderabad of the last couple of days, but yesterday's newspapers, the top story was the transfer of bureaucrats in Telangana uh, by uh, the political class for a variety of reasons that were apparently, according to the newspapers, not really related to governance, but related to other issues. So here the Supreme Court intervenes, uh, comes up with a robust judgment saying that, yes, there must be fixed terms, there must be an independent appointments commission, there must be a grievance redressal commission, so on and so forth. Really sort of unparalleled, right, when you think of traditional roles adopted by the court. Uh, if you wanted to do an academic exercise, what is this role adopted by the court? This is a rather unconventional role adopted by the court. The Right to Education Act, and the Right to Education which the Supreme Court has crafted in this country well before um, the constitutional amendment. Here you have the court wading in to what is an absolute requirement when it comes to a socioeconomic imagination of self in this country. And this is a, a case that we took to court where um, my clients were the only private um, foundation, educational foundation that actually was invested in defending um, the, the, the Right to Education Act, which, which seeks to, amongst other things, open up private educational institutions to uh, disadvantaged children. And the court was very clear, Chief Justice Kapadia says very clearly that yes, I mean, we, we are completely on board with this Right to Education Act, making this point that really the Right to Education Act is a court-created right in India, well before. Uh, parliament uh, and governments waded in. This is um, the Right to Education Act. This is just a clip. Um, and the court also wades in to, um, to really a, a case now which in other contexts, in South Africa or Chile and, and other countries, warranted truth commissions. But here, in the Victims of Extrajudicial Executions Association versus um, the Union of India and the state of Manipur, when faced with 1528 alleged extrajudicial um, executions or fake encounters by the Indian military and by um, state police in Manipur, um, and these are sort of, this is a, a slab from Manipur, these are, um, you know, uh, uh, graveyards. Um, and, and there are many legal issues, including the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, um, acting as a shield uh, to convicting or trying a military personnel in civilian courts because of a lack of, you know, court of inquiries being constituted by the military. The court says this, 
when it decides to wade in to, in fact, investigating and seeing if prosecution is necessary for military personnel. The court says this, quote, it is necessary to know the truth so that the law is tempered um, with justice. The exercise for knowing the truth mandates ascertaining whether fake encounters or extrajudicial executions have taken place. And if so, who are the perpetrators of these human rights violations and how can the next of kin be commiserated with and what further steps ought to be taken, if any? The problem before the courts tends to become vexed when victims are alleged to be militants, insurgents or terrorists. In such cases, how does anyone, including the court, assess the degree of force required in a given situation and to see whether it was excessive and retaliatory or not. So this is the kind of response of this court, which is to say that it's unusual, to say that it's brave, to say that it's exacting when it comes to other institutions failing to address these questions of fake encounters. The court weighs, weighs right in, is confident um, at navigating even 1528 cases and we're back in court um, on the 8th, which is Monday, um, where in fact now the CBI is expected to come back um, on 92 specific cases. So this is really detailed monitoring by India's apex court. So keep in mind these cases, right? Bureaucratic reform, right to education, constitutional validity, extrajudicial execution. So really cases on a macro level, which no other Supreme Court in any other part of the world um, I can envisage navigating such questions. Yet, the same Supreme Court, when it comes to questions of individual autonomy, when it comes to questions of gender and sexuality, comes out weak. The Supreme Court um, in 2013, I mean, as you well know, upheld the, val the constitutional validity of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Court drafted in 1860. Um, this is the section that, of course, is one of my favorite authors, Vikram Seth, who's on the cover of magazine saying, not criminal. A new writ petition has been filed uh, by us in the Supreme Court uh, on, the be on, on behalf of specific um, LGBT Indians, um, where we've argued that the continuance of Section 377 IPC on the statute books in free and independent India makes it all too clear that the constitutional guarantees of equality, fraternity, dignity, life, and liberty, which are the basis of the constitutional contract on which this country was founded, are not extended to petitioners. Section 377 IPC, in particular, is a relic of colonial rule and of 19th century Victorian morality for what is, for that the impugned section violates fundamental rights of petitioners under Articles 14, 15, 16, 19, and 21. Um, of the Constitution, and these are our clients, Nafte Singh Johar, a Sahitya Academy Award winner, um, Ritu Dalmia, award-winning chef, artist, um, and, and this is the founder of the Nimrana chain of um, hotels um, in this country. So when it comes to cases of individual sexuality of Indian citizens, the court not only came out on the wrong side of history in Nas Foundation, but really in an egregious uh, display of a lack of imagination of both constitutional values um, as well as, you know, the basis um, of a founding understanding uh, of each individual citizen. And the court doesn't stop short when it comes to such shoddy jurisprudence um, just on sexuality. This is a case that is before this court right now, and this is the case of Hadia. Um, and, and this is a case of a 24-year-old um, Initially, Hindu woman, Akhila, from Kerala, India's most literate state, who was training to be a homeopath. Akhila, born a Hindu, uh, discovers Islam through two of her classmates and converts to Islam. She adopts the name of Hadia, which in Arabic means, and I learned this recently, means a guide to the path of righteousness. Her father agitated by her conversion, and that is Hadia on the left, and that is a picture of her at the Supreme Court, being led into court. Uh, a few weeks ago, mind you, uh, you know, she's now 25 years old. She's an Indian woman who is 25, so bear that in mind. So, uh, her father goes to the Kerala High Court asking that his daughter be produced in court because Hadia decides to leave her parental home and live with her um, college roommates. So, in December 2016, midway through many months of hearings, Hadia informs the High Court, and this is the Kerala High Court, that she's married a young Muslim man, Safin Jahan. 
the High Court of Kerala reacts with rage, a rage that I call legally perplexing, and orders that Hadia be escorted by the police to live in a hostel, that she not be allowed to possess or use a mobile phone, and this is from the order of, of the court. And only that her parents be allowed to meet her and that her husband's, quote, educational family background and antecedents be investigated. The court's rationale for this is that Hadia is particularly vulnerable since she is an unmarried daughter, these are the words of the court, in her 20s, whose custody lies with her parents till marriage. Hmm, and that's probably my mother calling. The court's rationale for this is that Hadia is particularly vulnerable since she is an unmarried daughter in her 20s whose custody lies with her parents till marriage. In the words of the court, uh, court, quote, its duty is to ensure that she is not exposed to further danger, especially since her marriage was performed in accordance with Islamic rights. Now, the rationale given by the Kerala High Court is at odds with both statutory and Indian constitutional law because statutory law enables the court to act as a guardian only to minors or the mentally unsound. Hadia is neither one of these. The Indian constitution recognizes adult Indian women and men as citizens possessing equal rights and freedoms. It makes no distinction between married and unmarried um, women. When Hadia's husband and other parties appeal this order to the Supreme Court, um, the, the Supreme Court's reaction is equally troubling. Um, a three-judge bench of the Supreme Court asks Hadia to come to court and poses questions to her in open court pertaining to her qualifications, interests in studies, perception of life, and what she intends to do in future while counseling her to finish her education. Incredibly, like the High Court, the Supreme Court appoints a local guardian, her college principal, and orders the police to escort her to a hostel from where she will continue her education. The Supreme Court also goes a step further than the Kerala High Court. It's ordered an investigation into this interfaith marriage by the federal level National Investigation Agency. And the NIA currently accuses the husband of belonging to a fundamentalist Muslim organization and being complicit in a love jihad conspiracy. Um, this case will now uh, be heard um, in court in a few weeks. Now, before I, I close, I'd like to say this, that you know, marriage and love, these are these two cases that we last discussed, and we can discuss plenty of others, across races, caste, ethnicities, and, and same sexes, you know, has inspired and will continue to inspire cultural, political, and legal wars. No country has been spared such trauma and rage. But typically, modern constitutional courts and liberal democracies have always come out on the side of free choice of marriage. In the United States, we call those cases Loving versus the State of Virginia, 1960s, which is an interracial marriage case, to more recently the same-sex Obergefell, where the United States Supreme Court has adjudicated for the ability of two individuals to marry uh, each other, even if it's of the same sex. Now, Hadi and, Sh and Shafin Jahan, of course, I don't think anticipated being India's loving uh, case. Um, there is, you know, ample partition, post-partition context to this kind of conversation and this kind of fear of interfaith marriage, right? Part of that post-partition conversation is in the 19, early 1950s, less than a decade after partition of the country, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to profess religion is constitutionally guaranteed and included the fundamental right to propagate one's religious views. Slowly, however, in the 70s, the cases grew more complex. The constitutional validity of anti-conversion statutes in two states, Madhya Pradesh and Orissa, were challenged. The Supreme Court upheld these state statutes, explaining that while there was a fundamental right to transmit and spread the essential tenets of one's religion, it did not extend to a right to convert a person to one's religion. At present, six Indian states out of 29 have anti-conversion laws. These six contemporary non-conversion laws provide for prohibition and punishment with a jail term for conversion by inducement, like gifts, material benefit, or conversion by use of force or fraud, amongst others. It is unclear, and there's nothing on the record in Hadia's case to show that any of this has happened. So I'm gonna stop here, but I'm gonna stop here and leave you with this thought, right?
that you know this is a country that was founded um, with 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 horrific. Its founding was defined by horrific interreligious rage and violence, where millions of Indians, and it doesn't matter whether you're Indian or Pakistani, but millions of South Asians were brutalized, right? And these are the memories of generations of, uh, uh, in, in this country. So when a case like Hadia, which, which deals with an interfaith marriage, comes before the court, the Indian Constitutional Court, which is the Supreme Court, must react and reflect on what is at stake. And it is not simply constitutional fabric, it is not simply you know, citizenship rights of an adult Indian citizen woman. It is not simply that you know, we are confronted by you know, a kind of a benign patriarchy, but it is also that it is a court then that is not reflecting on the constitutional history of their own founding and your founding. Right? So I'll stop at this and we'll take questions. But any questions? None whatsoever. Everything was just crystal clear. Yeah. Anyone? Well, thank you for the talk. It was. Thanks for coming. Sorry, could you tell me your names when you and when you sort of ask the questions? Uh, my name is Prashant Reddy. I'm an uh, I'm a newly joined faculty over here. I teach intellectual property law and right. administrative right. law. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it's a pretty basic question. Do you think that the Indian constitution at the time that it was enacted really reflected the values of the country at the time? I mean, I understand the constitution is a lovely liberal document which presents those values, but I mean, the last few years, I think, yeah. have been a revelation for us with social media, sure. where we've got a much deeper insight into how this country thinks. And do you really think that there, do you think that there is a, a widening gap between what the, con the population thinks over here and what the constitution actually states? Yeah, thank you for that question. Do we take one question at a time, or? Yeah, well, thanks for that question, Prashant. Congratulations on. On, 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 on your new position, and, and I hope you have a wonderful uh, teaching, um, you know, career. Um, and, and congratulations to Nalsar for getting wonderful faculty. I know your work. Thanks for that question. Um, no, I, I look, I, I think this, and I think the best way to answer this would be in the words of Ambedkar and Prasad, right? Um, that these questions of you know, let's, let's look at certain social value implications of interreligious marriage or um, choice of national language, uh, you know, so on and so forth. These questions are not legal questions, simpliciter. And they may well be questions that are legal questions that show up in a court of law or in parliament. But these are questions how you navigate these times will speak to the legitimacy that the Constitution enjoys, right? And how did the drafters, who were also politicians, you know, um, so when I think of Nehru first addressing the Constituent Assembly, I mean, Nehru does something very interesting, which in some ways perhaps Rao and Ambedkar don't do. Each, each is playing a different role. But Nehru is doing this wonderful social legitimacy metamorphosis of the Constitution and the social legitimacy metamorphosis of the Constituent Assembly. Um, one of the first sessions that he addresses, I remember he says, you know, this constitution is being, is being adopted on behalf of the people of India. This constitution is in fact reflects, you know, a nationalist movement. And he is deploying, right? He's doing something politically very clever. He is deploying the legitimacy and the popularity and the political goodwill of both the Indian National Congress at that time, as well as the nationalist movement. He is deploying that to this constitution um, crafting exercise, right? Um, which takes me then to the question that you pose, which is, what are the values of a majority of people, right? Now, the thing is, it's interesting, the Indian Constitution did not have a referendum um, clause. 
uh, prior to adoption, which some, not all, but some contemporary constitution making projects have, right? So we explicitly did not have this referendum clause. We explicitly had a political leadership or upper layers of the political leadership that chose to invest legitimacy in this project by very strategically navigating their own political goodwill and drawing that in to the Constituent Assembly. So at that time, there was this great excitement uh, about not just freedom, but eventually the adoption of the Constitution. I mean, there are these wonderful montages, clips uh, of the adoption of the Constitution and the Constituent Assembly. Um, and the first sort of Republic Day, where people come to attend these Republic Day celebrations. Though it's very strange that we have a military display on Republic Day, and you know, you have to wonder what does that meant to mean, uh, and how, in in some in some way, why would you not choose to commemorate the Constitution on Republic Day with with something more, perhaps? But nonetheless, there is this kind of strategic investment by a political leadership to give something. Um, legitimacy. Um, and I think that it takes us to one of the institutions I study, which is parliament and governments, right? What is the role of government? What is the role of parliament in a liberal democracy? What is the role of parliament uh, in a constitutional democracy? Is it simply franchise, right? Because India is a constitutional democracy. It's not just a democracy simpliciter. Democracy simpliciter is franchise, right? Constitutional democracy is something more. Right? It's a check on majorities, what, irrespective of what the majority might feel, irrespective of what a you know, larger mass of people might be, there are constitutional checks. This is not an un, unlimited, unfettered parliament, like Britain, where there is unparalleled, unfettered parliamentary sovereignty. This parliament is checked by the constitution. So that kind of populism, right? We already opted not to navigate in 1950. There is no going back on that constitutional choice that was made. We are not a country of majority populism. We cannot be uh, Russia or, you know, even America up to this point. We are a constitutional democracy where the constitution will be that check on government and on people if need be minorities and majorities. I hope that addresses some parts of your, of your concerns. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for your lecture. Uh, my name is Karan. I'm from Good Australia. shirt, Karan. It's Thank red. you. It's actually a kurta. Oh, lovely. lovely. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I'm, I'm sort of doing, you know, maroon or whatever this is today. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a final year student. Yeah. And um, I've recently been interested in how you look at different theories of adjudication mm -hmm. that tailor themselves specifically to the context in which you are adjudicating. So I'm really hoping I'm able to frame my question right, because even sure. I'm just learning to read up on these topics. If you look at Indian constitutional or adjudication on our key constitutional cases, right, you always have two set of cases. Mm -hmm. You have those cases that you say have advanced individual liberty, and those cases like Nas or Hadiya that have retracted from it. Right? You have this divide, but the common thing in both the cases is a general criticism that the court oversteps its bounds and sure. limits. So even in our so-called progressive cases, they say that you have transgressed what would be an ideal separation of powers within the country, which is also constitutionally mandated. Absolutely. How as a law student or as a law professor, would you reconcile adjudication then? Mm. Right? At what point do you draw a limit and say, that it is okay for the court to overstep here, but not here. Because right. even that determ determination to me seems very subjective, because yeah. I think this case doesn't further liberty, it's not okay. Right, I think it's a good question, thank you. Um, Prashant, um, I think that, you know, and I am in complete agreement on that, you know, that the court has transgressed many um, constitutionally envisaged separation of powers um, design choices that were made. Um, this is also a court that, you know, when it starts out as a federal court, um, you know, post-independence, is a, is a fairly sort of disciplined court. You know, very few cases come to the court. Um, it stays close to the law um, as it adjudicates and does so even in colonial times 
reasonably independently. This is what's that, this is what's interesting about it, and it comes to this uber muscular position, you know, l later on in the 80s, where it's trying to reclaim its legitimacy. But this is a story you've heard before. I mean, I think. Uh, my senior colleagues at the bar, you know, Rajiv Dhava and senior academics, Upendra Bakshi, tell that story well of how and why the court adopts this role. I think, you know, I, I, I have a sort of, you know, I have this kind of schizophrenic sort of uh, approach to it, which is, you know, as a practicing lawyer, I am very happy for the court to wade in to socioeconomic governance decision making, right? So whether it's bureaucratic reform or whether it's uh, you know, RTE or so on and so forth, numerous um, uh, cases. But, you know, as a thinker of the, about the Constitution um, and, and when I teach, um, you know, it is, it is very difficult in any comparative context, or even if you teach Indian Constitution on by itself, um, to, to tell the story of the court if you also contend that constitutional design must be taken seriously, separation of powers must be taken seriously. And this is a dichotomy, you know, this is a real uh, dichotomy, it's a real challenge. I think the, the, the one other way of sort of navigating uh, this dilemma, if you will, um, is that, you know, when it comes to questions of individual citizenship, individual autonomy, self-determination, gender, sexuality. I think the problem is not so much that the court is doing anything differently, right? It's, it's doing what it does in these other cases, it's doing here as well. It's saying, so, what do you want to do? You know, what, what is it that you'd like to study? It's this kind of, you know, our wisdom will take you forward um, um, sort of approach. I guess the only sort of way to critique that is to say, that a constitutional understanding of the individual citizen uh, warrants that the citizen is a bearer of a modicum of freedom, um, autonomy, um, that includes things like right to marriage um, uh, or right to be intimate with whoever he or she wants to be intimate with. Um, and I think it is a real challenge, right, because it is a real challenge to, for me personally to kind of uh, make good on this contradiction. My critique of it is always that there are constitutional values. These are the founding values. This is the way you have interpreted those values. So let us also bring those values to bear in not just socioeconomic rights and issues of governance, but also these cases. Um, because when it comes to you know, a certain line of legal issues that confronts the court, including questions of obscenity, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression, the court has been a reluctant forbearer of, the, of constitutional values. Um, and I think that with, with modernity, it must shed that forbearance and that reticence, which, it, which defines the court on certain issues. My name is Manohar. Hi. Uh, I teach here uh, language, law and language and law and literature courses. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I'm not very familiar with uh, law and constitution yet. Uh, just getting to know a little bit more after coming here. I'm just one semester old. Um, I'm glad that you brought in the question of uh, partition and language. But I'm wondering, how does one think about um, the constitution that we have today. Uh, in relation to what partition has done to the language question. Mm. Uh, because there was a very different kind of imagination of India mm. uh, prior to the 40s. Yeah. Uh, especially in the early 20s, uh, when you think of, for example, uh, the Andhra Mahasabha here, yeah. which you may be aware of. Yes, yes. Uh, the kind of India that they imagined, uh, there's nothing to see that kind of India in the constitution. Yeah. And also constitution was not imagined as a single homogeneous constitution for the whole of India. Uh, during the Andhra Mahasabha period, there are writers who were thinking of a constitution for the Telugus. Oh. And uh, also for any other linguistic groups separately. And there were also attempts made, let's say, to translate 
different constitutions from around the world into yeah. Telugu as kind of introdu introducing to the people how a constitution should be, what a constitution uh, should be about. Uh, all that suddenly dramatically changes in the 40s. Yeah. And uh, the fears of the partition goes into the making of the constitution, this strong uh, constitution with, uh, with which a cent very highly powerful and, I mean, massively powerful central uh, government, which gives powers too. And uh, the federal imagination completely vanishes. Yeah. And, and in order to understand the language question, one must go to the, that period. And unless you have the federal India, you cannot really have national languages. So today we have a situation where English continues, and that is because the Anglophone class, which actually was at work, and any time I think when we talk about the language question, the constitution, uh, we should not forget about the bureaucracy. Mm. Uh, we still have IAS, right, which was ICS, and then we have IAS now, uh, which also uh, connects up with the question, uh, the language question, but why is English important? For whom is English important? And why is that today we have a constitution, but uh, everything like education, administration, judiciary, everywhere we function in a language which is not the people's language. So the structure, in a way, is inherited from the British, where you have uh, the rulers speak one language and the ruled uh, administer their lives in another language. So citizenship itself doesn't seem to have much of a meaning. Yeah. Right? What exactly is citizenship when you when you can't communicate with your rulers, right? Which is which the governing class basically is the Anglophone class today. So I just wanted to make yeah. this comment and uh, yeah. hear. So thank you for that question. Um, I think it's a it's a great question. No, no, not at all. Sometimes uh, the best questions tend to need, um, you know, tend to be longer. Um, so thanks for that question. So uh, you know, I recently met a young. Uh, scholar uh, at Yale, and he is studying uh, the constitutions of princely states. Uh, uh, you know, the, which and those are the constitutions that existed uh, not just before 1940, but well prior to um, the 1940s, well prior to you know sort of partition. Um, and, and, and as we were discussing um, some of those. Constitution. I mean, his point was simply this, uh, you know, like, like you're saying, his point was, but there were many of those constitutions which were actually more progressive, you know, transgressive, if you will, than even the Indian constitution. Um, and clearly, you know, that strategic choice uh, um, uh, is made to navigate risk of a certain kind and of, of making this kind of unitary heavy federal constitution. Uh, with a strong administrative center, with fiscal federalism weighed uh, in favor of the center. Um, and in many ways, I think, you know, Ambedkar explains this choice, where he says that, you know, the Constitution is supposed to be an administrative roadmap. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very detailed because there were real fears, I think, at those times of, one, you had to navigate the challenges of the princely states, um, you know, which Patel was, was doing. Um, you had to navigate the challenges of a departing colonizer. Uh, you had to navigate the challenges of partition itself. Um, and you had to navigate the challenges of, you know, being this big tent constituent assembly with a diversity of political ideologies um, in play. But I think, you know, some of this is also genuinely a reflection of how fragile, violent, um, and unstable the time was, you know. Um, and I think, you know, one of the great sort of disservices um, in how constitutional law is taught um, uh, in contemporary India is that it is not taught as also being post-conflict constitutionalism, that your constitution was made amid great crisis, great conflict, and great hardship. Uh, uh, and, and, and that imagination, if you bring to bear on this document, then certainly some of the more kind of hard structural choices which seem to speak to a steel state, um, as I call it, makes sense only because of just the, the, the time that was India. 
um, in not just the 40s and not just partition, but even pre-partition. Uh, well, you know, the kind of instability. Um, this idea that you would have to make one hundreds and hundreds of princely states um, is in itself a mammoth, not just logistical and governance task, but it's a mammoth task of imagination. What is that identity will, which you will give this new country? And how do you give this new country that identity with these kinds of diversity of, you know, other identities and conflicting identities? So I think that there is a real, there was a real kind of assessment, you know, and I'm not saying all of that is correct, but there was a real risk assessment uh, that was being made and that resulted in this kind of constitutional choice where I take your point and I agree that it's a federal heavy, um, you know, constitution and, and not a constitution for a federation of states. Um, I, I take that point um, and I completely agree with you. On your point of, you know, the Anglophile class, I mean, you know, it's very interesting because if you think of, you know, I, I, I live and work mostly uh, in Delhi and if you think of, uh, the ruling class uh, right now, it's not exactly the Anglophile class, though I agree with your point in general. Right now, it's the Hindi as national language class, right? Um, and I want to sort of think about language, right? Because if, you, if one of the, you know, areas that I had to sort of think about and study was the kind of second the breakup of Pakistan, you know, and why is that happening? Why does language become so important? Uh, because language is access to resources. One part of it is identity. The other part of it is the access to resources. What do I mean by that? If you think about Sri Lanka, Tamils and, and Sinhalese, um, it is about changing the language that the administrative exam is taken in uh, to ensure that you would become part of, of quote, the ruling class. So I think that you are at this moment right now where Hindi as national language is, is indicative of a certain ruling class in play and is indicative of the social and uh, values of that ruling class, but as well as the kind of, you know, um, I, I would also say the, as well as the kind of not entirely uncomplicated regard that is that that class has for the Indian Constitution, um, and I know you know we've had Union cabinet ministers talking about um, you know the secular values of the Indian Constitution as reflecting uh, a lack of parentage uh, in in the words of this Union cabinet minister. I'm sure you followed uh, the controversy. So I think there is genuinely one part of it, which is that ruling classes will seek to maintain. Uh, and entrench their control using all kinds of techniques. One of it will be nationalism, another will be language, whether it's English or Hindi, um, you know, and, and other kinds of, of sort of frameworks. But vis-a-vis -vis English, your, your point is, you know, I, I, I agree with it completely. We have created, you know, an elite, which has remained an elite, uh, and we have created the fabric of a state that is very far removed. Uh, from the average citizen that the state is supposed to serve. There's no question about it. Um, the thing about, I think, constitution making um, is that in many ways, it's a hegemonic exercise. It's a homogenous assemblies often get constitutions made where heterogeneous assemblies don't. Um, it is really often a task and an exercise of efficient management um, and often less so uh, about kind of, you know, a larger diversity uh, uh, sort of representation. And that's why constitution making is complex. Uh, they're not often things of beauty, but they're often, you know, instruments that are extremely efficient, um, that are successful. Yes. Can it be summed up that our courts, our Ragish I teach political science here, uh, when it comes to socio-economic legislation, courts look a little bit radical, mm. but when it comes to the question of what Ambedkar, as you are quoting and as we all celebrate, for one thing, which he said, 
individual is the basis of our constitution it is not community yeah uh, but probably the courts are becoming very conservative when it is coming to the question of individual right whether be it sexuality be it the choice of marriage be it uh, so the individual right aspect uh, it seems to be more conservative why is it so because when when it is so progressive when it is talking about giving education to everybody or making for as for example uh, give food to people and yeah. then monitor it and all that kind of stuff and all that yeah absolutely but when it, when it is and then as a corollary i also would like to uh, you to reflect upon what is our course thinking about identities also for example fifth and sixth schedule yeah. which to to my mind uh, i see I, i look at india as at least four parts one is kashmir the other is fifth schedule sixth schedule and the rest of india so how do it look at because much of the armed forces uh, thing whenever it goes to the court and then when the court becomes jittery and wary and all that it is not even very comfortable with the question of other identities and all that yeah. autonomy autonomy of the identities yeah. as well no thank you uh, thank you for that question see i think that you know the the preliminary conversation uh, that when one wants to talk about courts one should have is you know also who are judges right who is a judge um, and in my experience you know i've often found that actually lower court judges are much more in tune uh, with the modern country the modern society the modern city contemporary delhi contemporary bombay than apex court judges um and i think often apex court judges will say the same thing um uh, or perhaps they won't um but really i find that it is sort of lower court judges who have that connection you know for they are still driving themselves to work you know they are still um sort of engaging they tend to be younger they tend to be more diverse um in delhi one of the most remarkable things that has happened over the last 10 years is that you have more women um judges becoming lower court judges you have more women at the high court and obviously that makes a difference in adjudication that makes a difference why does it make a difference in adjudication because you have different imaginations of the litigant you have different imaginations that are possible of the identities of people who come before you right um some of this is that you know the supreme court has to open up when it comes to who is a judge um you know there are there is one woman judge on the supreme court today um uh, you know i i've i've often wondered you know what must it have been like for hadia to be in a courtroom where the judges are all male the lawyers on all sides with the exception of indira jaising uh is male and most of the courtroom is men and then she's being asked this question so what do you want to do with your life you know uh who there has the expertise um to decide what this 25 year old indian woman wants to do with her life right so some of this is i think we have to you know as judiciaries change those imaginations will change some of this is about what you teach in the classroom here because your students will also become judges and practitioners what are the identities that you bring to bear in the disciplines you teach uh you know i remember when i when i did a case um initially on salva judum on 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 tribal rights i was fascinated at how law officer after law officer would always use the language of those people them right otherizing and i'm thinking what well, these are indian citizens the constitution's imagination of the citizen is not those people um so i think that part of this is what is our own life experience and realists who write on judiciaries will will tell us this part of this is an opening up of the judiciary you need to see more diversity represented in the judiciary i'm not just talking about gender uh, but part of this is how we teach the law you know if if the law is taught as a kind of dead colonial um uh, subject uh, method uh, and if the law is taught Uh, you know as distinct from the people it's supposed to speak to and i'm not sort of making a larger claim 
um, for you know uh, sort of a communist or socialist constitution. I'm saying that you know the law can also be taught in a way that it seeks to engender that kind of imagination. Any other questions? We can talk about something else. Doesn't have to be constitutions and oh, sorry, we will stop talking. Sure. So we have what a couple of minutes more. Yeah. Oh hi. Uh, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Sure. We can. We'll take both. Go ahead. Whatever. That's good. I can't. I can't hear you right now. Yeah. Hi, I'm Prerna. I teach legal methods here. So I've always been curious uh, to know uh, that uh, post-independence, Nehru says that it has been a political revolution, not just a political revolution, but a social economic revolution. Yeah. Also, Ambedkar saying that uh, the constitution is a social document. Then why were they so hesitant to make social rights uh, enforceable, justiciable? Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always been curious to know this. Yeah. Do you want to collect? OK, social rights. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm Raj Vardhan from, from the second year. My question, uh, you talked a lot about Section 377 and how. Not a lot. Actually. But like a bit, OK. <laughs> huh. So my question is that, yes, uh, Removing 377 would be a significant way forward, but it doesn't help in the marginalization and stigmatization of the LGBT community that's happening. And I know that most of those things would be removed by social movements and out of court uh, um, uh, activism. Sure. But what is uh, the next legal fight that we need to have in the courts with relation to the LGBT community? Yeah. So maybe I can quickly take those two and. Oh, one more. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for that lovely lecture. My name Thank is you. Vishnu. I'm Hi, Vishnu. Here. So, uh, taking forward Karan's question, do you think there's any inherent value in assessing the Supreme Court's performance from a purely con a sort of a consequentialist standpoint? You know, assessing purely positive, okay. negative outcomes. You know, and how would you reconcile that with the Ambedkar? Uh, with Ambedkar's idea of constitutional morality and you know deference to form and things like that. So I just wanted yeah. to take that question forward. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for all three questions. I'll, I'll take these three. Um, one, I think, social rights, uh, Professor. I think it's a good question. You know, here's the thing: uh, constitutions anywhere, right? Constitutional constitutions as instruments and courts as interpreters and adjudicatory in instruments. These are just very difficult uh, institutions to implement, to navigate, to factor in costs uh, when it comes to social rights, right? So India's constitutional jurisdiction is actually unique and quite exceptional. Now you have increasingly sort of courts looking to India. But really, when you think about this in the 1950s and 60s, you know, when, when directive principles of state policy are being thought about and being kind of, you know, turned around by judges in their courtrooms, I mean, in, in many ways, in the ideal world, you wouldn't have courts needing to be the space to navigate these questions. In a functioning constitutional democracy, your member of parliament, your state government, your zilla uh, panchayat, you know, these would be the places where you would navigate these questions. Um, you know, whatever you want to call it, whether it's a governance void, whether in Pratap Mehta's words, it's a jurisprudence of exasperation, the courts have become spaces to navigate social and economic rights because I think movements at least find that they can get a hearing in court, right? And so this has become that institution of first resort now because in many ways, your local governments, your local units of governance are just non-responsible or inaccessible, especially if you've been historically marginalized. Um, so I guess that's part of it, you know, um, and I think that, that that recognition is there, that there is also, you know, there is also a logistical disconnect between using courts uh, and constitutions to implement socioeconomic rights. 
uh, so many, lack of expertise, a financial assessment, so on. I mean, the list is long, right? And you see this even in the, in the adjudication of socioeconomic rights cases, like education, where the court is repeatedly asking uh, litigants and claimants for expertise, for data as it pertains to education. Uh, education institutions, government schools, private schools, which, you know, government bodies would have easily accessible. So there is also that other question of, are these the forums with maximum expertise? But we can talk sort of more about it. Um, I, I think I can sort of tag team those two questions together, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and start by saying this. See, I think one facet of this is, of course, you know, the outcomes we like and their outcomes we don't like, you know, or their outcomes we despise, right? Um, I have tried to, the best of my ability, assess um, the jurisprudence of the court not on the basis of outcome, right? Um, I can say that the way Nas Foundation was, the outcome um, was poor, sure, but, you know, I have even more issue with the quality of jurisprudence what was that judgment? You know, I mean, it is just embarrassing uh, when that judgment is discussed. There is lack of legal reasoning, there is contradictory reasoning, there is wrong law being cited, there is an in, uh, there's a lack of appreciation for founding values, there is a total lack of recognition uh, and, and, and a blatant, you know, pointed lack of re recognition of what's happening in the rest of the world, and there is this horrific outcome. But you know, apart from the horrific outcome is look at the quality of jurisprudence. Is that the jurisprudence of our country's apex court? Right? So I, 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 I want to move away from positive and negative outcomes. I want to move to quality of decision making, legal reasoning adopted, and consistency in reasoning. This is something that I, I really would like to push in a court of different benches. And this is not just one court, this is 13 courtrooms. What about consistency? So that's part of it. Finally, you know, your point on, uh, you know, um, I think that there is no question, right, that movements uh, will always achieve more through local politics and education and, uh, you know, than a court case will ever will. Right? There is no question. But when I think you're at a position where this is so basic, you still have a statute and a criminal statute uh, on the books, you have to knock that out, right? And that, is, that will always be the first step because we know that that criminal statute is used to stigmatize, is used to blackmail, is used to diminish a sense of self, which the Constitution actually, I think, does not countenance, right? So I think that's step one. There's no question, I think, when it comes to all kinds of litigations, you know, I'm very reluctant for court cases to become the rallying cause of social movements. You know, those social movements have to exist uh, independent of those court cases, and they also have to exist. Perhaps the court case can be one facet of a multifaceted approach. But politics in this country for any cause of action cannot be located in a court case. Um, and I think, you know, for young people across communities and different identities, um, I mean, those politics stems from all kinds of things. It stems from, you know, union politics, students' groups, uh, professional associations, uh, you know, all kinds of conversations. And in fact, that's what this country has always been. I think it's only in the last few decades that the court has become a site of politics. Uh, and it could be that, but it certainly cannot be the dominant form of politics or the only uh, site of resistance. Great, so I will stop with that. Thank you so much for spending your lunch break with me and uh, good luck for the new year.